All right, so welcome everyone to the webinar, Trees for Bees, Pollinator Habitats and Urban Forests. My name is Holly Campbell and I will be the host for the webinar today. I'm an Extension Associate with Southern Regional Extension Forestry, working in urban forestry and wildland fire education and outreach. As part of the Cooperative Extension System, our office develops educational products and resources to support forestry and natural resource programs across the Southern US region, like this webinar today. Our website is sref.info if you'd like to learn more about what we do, and that, um, that web link is in the top right corner. So our presenter today is Dr. Elizabeth Benton from the University of Georgia. Before formally introducing Dr. Benton, I will provide a short introduction. First, I would like to thank the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension for co-hosting our Zoom webinar today. So thanks to you guys. Um, today's webinar is part of a larger series entitled Understanding Urban and Community Forests, an extension webinar series. This series was planned by Southern Regional Extension Forestry with input from several cooperative extension urban and community forestry experts in the Southern region. This slide includes the planning partners for the series. Their input on key topics and speakers for the series was essential. The series is designed for educators, specifically cooperative extension, county educators. However, each webinar in the series may also be relevant to natural resource managers, other educators, arborists, urban foresters, and more. So regardless of your work focus, all of you are welcome to join today's webinar and any webinars in the series. So the goal of the series, which includes 12 web webinars in all, is two parts. So one, to increase extension educators' knowledge of research-based urban and community forestry information, and two, to provide educational resources that support delivery of that information to the public. So ultimately, the series aims to increase Extension's role in urban and community forestry education and outreach. We're hoping that this series will reach not only Extension personnel focused in horticulture, urban forestry, and natural resources, but also Extension involved in family and consumer sciences and other focus areas where appropriate. So this slide includes some of the other webinars in the series. You'll notice at the top of the slide, we have several archived webinars. We're actually on number eight of 12 webinars in all. Um, with our webinar today. So please feel free to check out some of the other webinars in the series. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Cooperative Extension, the Smith Lever Act formalized extension in formal agricultural education. Congress created the extension system to address rural agricultural issues. Today, however, extension has expanded its focus to match changes in society and economics, providing research-based education in areas like family and consumer sciences, forestry and natural resources, youth education, and much more. So popular extension programs that a lot of you are probably familiar with include 4-H and the Master Gardener program. Extension is a trusted information resource in communities, and for those of you who are not part of Extension, we make great partners to help disseminate information to the public. So please keep Extension in mind as a potential partner on your next urban and community forestry project. So though several Extension educators provide information about urban and community forestry to their communities, the number of educators in this area are few. So our hope is that these webinars will help increase Extension's role in this area. So there are likely participants listening to this webinar who are unfamiliar with a few of the very, very many benefits of urban trees and forests. So urban trees and forests help clean our water and air, reduce hot summer temperatures, wind speed and noise. They've been shown to reduce crime and provide a sense of place and connection, beauty and food. They also reduce our energy bills and increase our property value. And as Dr. Benton will share momentarily, urban trees provide habitat like food and shelter to pollinators. So I would now like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Benton. Dr. Benton is a forest entomologist and forest health outreach specialist at the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Georgia. Okay, Dr. Benton, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you can start.
All right. I hope everybody can see this. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon. We here. can't see you yet. Sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> Make sure you push the share button. Uh, Once you select your screen, just push the, um, the share right. screen. There we go. Got it. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon. I'm very excited to be talking to you about trees for bees and ways that we can provide pollinator habit in our uh, urban and suburban forest. So as a brief outline, I'll talk about the target audience, the usefulness of the material, the importance of pollinators, different types of pollinators we might expect to see, and then some pollinator habitat needs that we can provide, including specific things like trees that we can provide in our urban forest that can benefit them. My target audience is extension agents and educators. Um, Trees for Bees material um, was developed by the University of Georgia. We had a team of entomologists, horticulturalists, county extension agents that came together in the last year to develop a diverse suite of outreach materials that is available for anyone to use in their programs. And these materials really hit a diverse audience from children, to adults. Um, I gave a talk that was hosted by a fax agent at a senior center last month. We started out with 30 people in the talk and a few minutes into it a busload showed up with 20 more people that came from an hour and away to hear it. So there is a great interest um, in pollinators right now and that is wonderful. Um, there's a hands-on pollinator nesting box activity that really bring in woodworkers. Um, so a variety of interests that can be used with these materials. So why is this material useful? There is a lot of controversy over pollinators right now. There is some great information out there available to the public. There is some terrible information available to the public. Um, I give talks about this all the time. People could disagree all day long about this. But we can agree that pollinators are important and improving their habitat is a very good thing to do. And that is a unifying concept that can bring all of us together. So why am I talking about trees and bees? I am a forest and aquatic entomologist. I work with using pesticides and forest systems, um, assessing how we can effectively use them as well as how can we safely use them. And in response to stakeholder needs, um, we knew about non-target impacts or, or the lack of non-target impacts and the safety of these products in the canopy and in the water and in the soil, but we really didn't know about impacts to pollinators. So this is where I began to walk down the pathway of, of looking at pollinators and thinking about them. And as a result of working on it research-wise, it really showed a good opportunity for outreach as well um, in a way that we could unify people and make positive changes. So why should we care about pollinators? Um, and I have a footnote here that often exists in these statistics can be overflated by the media and, and certain NGOs, but 76% of global plant crop species do rely on pollination to some extent. Um, many crops that are not insect pollinated include things like rice and wheat and corn, so some of the staple crops. But 76% of the species that we use for crops rely on pollination um, from insects to some degree. 35% of our agricultural production come from crops that rely to some extent on bees. And there's a wide variety there. Some crops have to be, um, must be insect pollinated to reproduce at all. Others use insect pollination to increase fruit set, increase fruit weight and quality and increase yield. And so that's very important that 35% of the crops that we use need pollination to some extent, and that, in, that improves the amount and the quality of food that we get. In addition to cropping systems, pro pollinators are vital for our native wildflowers, our trees, our shrubs, and our entire ecosystem. And then some of the crops that we, we want to eat these foods, like citrus, bananas, blueberries, pears, and especially coffee. That one's underlined because it's very important. And we need pollinators for those things. So let's discuss a little bit of science about pollinators and trees. Whenever I started to walk down this path and begin to look for research in this area, I was surprised at how bees and forests are understudied, bees and forest canopies. Um, I think that the landscape of research is changing 
and we are beginning to learn more and more about our bees and our pollinators and that is wonderful and so five years from now i would expect this slide um, all of the information could take up a whole one hour seminar um, but one really cool study i would like to hi highlight it was conducted by the united states forest service in athens georgia and the entomologist sampled bees on the forest floor and in tree canopies. So they put flight intercept traps half a meter off the ground, and then another flight intercept traps 15 or more meters up in the air. So the picture on the bottom right-hand corner shows a circle, and then right in the middle of that circle is the trap that's lifted way high in the tree canopy. And what they found is that way in the air in the canopy, there was higher bee abundance, higher species richness and greater diversity in the bee communities. So having those, those layers of habitat are very important. It is suspected that bees feed in the canopy during low nectar and top pollen availability. So if we think about when do most flowering trees bloom? It's early in the spring. When do we think about you know, pollinator gardens and having those all those flowers, that's later in the spring and into the summer. So those floral resources provided by many trees are present when there's not as many resources in the landscape in general. And in addition, bees may be getting non-floral resources such as honeydew and sap. And I'm really excited about some of the studies that I know are ongoing, and I think that we're going to have some really great information in the next few years. As important as pollinators are, they do in fa face increasing challenges. Um, first of all, we do have an unintended consequences of pesticide misuse. A tool is only as good as we use it correctly. And when we use tools incorrectly, we are sure to have consequences that we don't want. And so as the target audience is educators, um, y'all are empowered to spread a good message about this and how we can safely use pesticides and all of that goes back to following the label and using these things when and how we are supposed to use them but in addition to that and probably more important to that are parasite and disease pressures especially varroa mite taking care of honeybees for example now is much different than it was before the 1980s when varroa mite was introduced to the united states and so we are facing our bee communities our bee honeybee communities are, are facing increased pressure because of that and in addition the picture to the lower left side is habitat loss as we build neighborhoods and shopping centers and factories and businesses and parking lots that's replacing native habitat with habitat that is lower quality and lower quantity of resources for pollinators. So here is what the typical new construction looks like. We've got a house, we've got more pavement down, lots of grass and a few plants that in general offer very few floral resources. Let's take this typical home and make it look like that and if we were intentional about providing resources and providing habitat what a difference that would make as we expand and have increasingly urban and suburban areas so we actually can help by making our yards more pollinator friendly what pollinators might we expect to see bees are the obvious choice but we also have wasps beetles flies butterflies and moths and hummingbirds and as we think about educating the public and engaging them more in the ecosystem that's around them um, I think we can really open people's eyes and and pique their interest into taking notice and caring about pollinators first let's start with the honeybee the honeybee is not native to the United States it is native to Europe it was brought over with the colonist and bees are widely used commercially for honey production and pollination services so um, when we think about native habitat and promoting natives we're really going to be thinking more about native bees because honeybees are a human managed um, element of our agricultural system honeybees live in large colonies that can have 20,000 up to 60,000 bees and one bee can visit 
up to 100 flowers per trip. So they are very important, but when we think about ecosystem and measuring ecosystem health, they're really not going to be our indicators because they are populations that we artificially manage. But native bees are where we should really be looking. There are over 3,500 species of native bees in the United States. Bumblebees do live in colonies, not as large as honeybees, um, but most of the bees are solitary. Most people have no idea of the diversity of native bees. When they think of bees, they think of honeybees. So if we can open the eyes of the general public to the diversity that we have that is native and what a good indicator of ecosystem health they are, I think that we're going to have a much better view of our system and how we can engage with it. Native bees have to some degree been understudied, but that is changing. There is lots of really exciting research going on in this area, and I'm excited to see all the new things that we're going to learn in the next five or ten years. So to cover a few of these, mason bees. They're called mason bees because they use mud in their nest construction, just like a brick mason would use a muddy type material between bricks. A female will make a nest of cells that are divided by mud, and these cells are little cavities or holes where she will stock it with pollen, nectar as food sources, and then an egg. The egg will hatch, the larva will begin to eat those resources the female has left, spin a cocoon, and then emerge the next spring. So we say they, they make these nests in holes. That would be things like decomposing logs, um, and, and wood around the area are pithy stems of, of plants from the year before. Related is leaf cutter bees from the same family. With a similar life cycle, the adults are going to emerge in the spring leading into summer. And after mating, the females will begin making their nest in a very similar cavity or hole. The nest will have many cells, each stocked with pieces of um, leaves and pollen and an egg, um, so very similar life cycle. Bumblebees, all right, they again form colonies that are between 50 and 500 individuals, and their nests are annual, so they only last a year. A female will begin stocking her nest and creating it and reproducing, and then as she has more offspring, her role will shift more to solely reproduction. Um, the queen, when she's setting up that nest, will be collecting the pollen and nectar for her new baby, baby bumblebees, which I could not resist putting in the presentation. So that's a great native um, bee to talk about. And then carpenter bees, which are often mistaken for bumblebees. They're very, both of them are, tend to be large bees. Bumblebees have a hairier abdomen, where carpenter bees tend to have a slick, shiny abdomen. Um, the females dig tunnels in the wood once mated. And a lot of times that wood is the trim on our house, our fences, our decks, and so when people talk about carpenter bees, they usually want to know how to kill them. But they are an important native pollinator, and if all possible, I, I advocate that we learn to live with them. Um, they make tunnels in the wood to fill with eggs in cells like the other bees. The cells are separated by wood chips and are equipped with pollen and nectar for the feeding young. The adults will emerge and hibernate over winter. All right, and then butterflies. Notice how we're starting to have pollinator gardens, but before we had a lot of butterfly gardens. And I really like this shift of focus away from just butterflies, which are, are beautiful and great, and have a lot of public engagement, to having a more well-rounded view of pollinators. Um, lots of pretty butterflies. They're, they're very visible for people, and, it, and it's a great um, insect to engage the public. Wasp. Um, this is when we get like carpenter bees get a little bit of mixed um, reviews on from the public because people don't want to be stung by wasps. But we've got lots of native wasps, not just the ones that the paper wasps that make nest near our houses. And um, they are pollinators. They are also predators and parasitoids, so they can provide biocontrol services in our landscape. Flies can be pollinators as well. Often we find those on small flowers and shaded areas, but in my own pollinator garden, they are out all over the place all the time. Some of them do provide biocontrol as parasitoids and predators. For instance, I have pictured surface, surfed fry, flies here. They're also known as hoverflies for their very distinctive hovering flight pattern. They are bee mimics, some of them, so sometimes they are mistaken for bees. 
And the larvae can eat aphids, scales, and thrips, again, providing those biocontrol services, as well as pollination services. Beetles can be important pollinators as well, and quite a diversity, things like soldier beetles, different longhorn beetles, flower beetles. Um, they are important pollinators, and we find them on a variety of our plants. And then hummingbirds, not an insect pollinator, but one that really has the eye of the public. And if you go into Walmart or any kind of hardware store, there will be plenty of options for hummingbird feeders. So again, having that well-rounded view of pollinators, and even better than having a, a hummingbird feeder, is having the plants available for the hummingbirds to use and seeing that we're providing those resources for them. So we've talked about the pollinators. Um, what do they need? We think flowers, and, and that is true, but they need much more than that. So again, we want this well-rounded pollinator community, but we need to have well-rounded resources for them. So nectar and forage, moisture and salts, shelter and space. So food, pollen and nectar. Pollen is mostly composed of proteins and lipids, and they can be collected or, um, and taken somewhere else for feeding young or as well as consumed on site. And for pollination, that's what we really want. We want the pollinators to get the pollen on their bodies and then transfer that to a different flower. And then nectar, which is mostly sugars. And they are located down in the floral nectaries at the base of the flowers. So the pollinator going to get the nectar will go across the pollen, pick up the pollen on the outside structures of the flower and get the nectar further in. Of, of interest is um, sometimes some insects rob nectar. And this can be an interesting thing to encourage people to look for in their pollinator gardens. So some bees and wasps have short tongues and they can't get into these tall, long flowers. So they will bypass the pollen, go around, pierce closer to the base of the flower and rob the nectar. So we said nectar, um, a little more detail is, is diverse forms of nectar, so lots of different kind of plants to provide that, and having nectar source year-round. Um, think about pollinators coming in the summer and summer flower gardens, but we want to have the resources for the pollinators all year round. So that means that we need diverse resources all year round. So lots of different types of plants to give nectar during different seasons. And then forage, that's referring to food for the caterpillars. And that's another one that could kind of be a hard fit for the public because we want the pollinators in our garden, but then we don't want to see anything eating the plants in our garden. But if we want the adults there, then we have to provide the resources for the young as well. So that might mean planting some things that the larvae want that we will sacrifice and realize may end up looking a little bit ratty because we want the caterpillars and other larvae to feed um, and we need to support and be supportive of that whole life cycle. Moisture and salts, and this is one that even as an entomologist, I really didn't think about very much until I began to walk down this path and learn all these new materials. Um, they need salts and that can be available from bare ground. So the pictures show the butterflies getting the salts off of the bare ground. And in many of our urban and suburban um, yards, neighborhood landscaping, we don't leave a lot of bare dirt. There's a lot of grass, there's a lot of cement and mulch. But bare dirt isn't very desirable. But if we can leave some of that area in our diverse planting habitat, then we can help provide that resource. And, and it also provides space for things like um, ground nesting bees. And then water, we need water. Most organisms need water. And after it rains, we do have water collecting leaves and things like that, like the picture in the upper left corner. And that's great, but we can also provide water sources for them as well. And that can be something as simple as filling up bird baths. And this depth isn't really important. They don't need deep pools of water. And so even in a bird bath, we can put gravel rocks down that will give extra landing spaces for the pollinators. The important thing is to keep it a fresh water source. So in providing water for the pollinators, we also do not want to, at the same time, provide stagnant water habitats for things like mosquitoes. And then shelter. And shelter, um, when I talk about doing trees for bees and having this kind of a diverse habitat, sometimes I use the expression messy gardening, 
we're going to do a little bit of messy gardening. So our typical subdivision house, again, has a driveway and a sidewalk, lots of grass, and a few plants, and there's no debris around. Everything is kept very manicured and pristine. Um, unfortunately, that does not provide a very diverse habitat for a healthy insect community. So if we can increase that diversity by things like rock piles and log piles, some things overwinter as adults, and that means that they need to get in little cracks and crevices to stay warm. Pithy stems, um, I mentioned that before, that that's a great resource for things that are going to make a uh, cavity nest. And so a lot of times we cut back these pithy stems at the very beginning of the year and the new foliage grows up. But if we can leave about a foot or so, that can actually be a resource for them. The new foliage is going to grow up and cover that up anyway. It's not going to look bad and it'll be a hidden resource that some of these pollinators will take advantage of. And then nesting boxes for bees. Sometimes they're called bee hotels. I've got a picture of one of mine on the right hand side. So for things like leaf cutter bees and mason bees, um, they need these cavities of dead wood to nest in. And we don't keep a lot of that around our house, but we can provide that. And this can be very simple. We got creative on ours because um, I'm married to a woodworker but it does not take this amount of detail. It can be a, something as very simple as an untreated 4x4 four four with holes drilled in it and hung up somewhere in the garden. Um, easy, easy. And one of the publications I'll highlight later on is goes step by step through cr creating these and how this can be a great hands-on outreach tool. And then members of your audience can take this home with them and they have something to look at all year round and even into the next year watching for their pollinators to come watching for them to emerge and then the pithy stem habitat can be recreated as well by using bamboo shoots little bits of dried holiday out bamboo and then taking um, the reeds just three or four reeds put them together tie them with twine and people can hang those up in their gardens hang them horizontally long ways and um, watch for pollinators to come over nest in those and then space. Um, space like dry soil for nesting sites. So we're back to dry soil again, but things like digger bees, bubble bees nest underground. And I notice in my garden areas where I really just don't put mulch at all or very little, and I do have bees coming in and out nesting in there. Open flat surfaces for sunning, so boulders or flagstones. So we can provide that food, water, shelter, and space that they need. Um, for having a well-rounded whole pollinator habitat. But this is trees for bees. So let's meet some of the trees that we can incorporate into our urban and suburban forest um, to be resources. And as I go through these, I'm using a lot of natives. And as we think about what we have in our neighborhoods, some of these are already there. And some of them are easy to incorporate. American holly is a dioecious. That means it has either male or female flowers. So the male flowers are on the left and the female flowers are in the middle. They bloom in the spring and are attractive to honeybees, birds, and butterflies. In addition, pictured on the right are berries, which are um, useful for wildlife. A lot of times we already have lots of holly in our landscaping, but if we're hedging them and making them shrubs, then the flowers and the berries that are of wildlife value are not being allowed to be present. So maybe it's not that we don't have those aspects there, but can we manage them differently to be beneficial to pollinators and wildlife? Yopon holly, um, same genus, grows from 12 to 45 feet tall, and it can have this drooping growth form that's very desirable in some landscape settings, and that's pictured on the far right. It's got the same kind of inconspicuous flowers as the American holly that's pictured toward the middle, but it is very attractive to pollinators. And they tolerate a variety of soil conditions and can grow in the sun as in partial shade as well. And then, like the American holly, they do have fruit that attracts birds and small mammals. Florida anise tree, sometimes called sweet alyssum, is a smaller tree. And notice that these are all things that stay relatively small. 
so far. And that's important because in many urban and suburban settings, people may be space limited. They may not have room for something that gets to be a giant tree, but there's lots of options for these smaller spaces. Right, the anise tree um, has these pretty dark red blooms in the spring with evergreen leaves, so it's going to have nice form all year long. They will tolerate heavy shade. Down in my neck of the woods in the deep south, I find those a lot in riparian areas, and so this is a very nice addition that can be more of a shrub form or a tree form, so that one's pretty versatile. Wild olive can grow 10 to 20 feet high and will be happy in sun to partial shade. They prefer fertile, moist, well-drained, acidic soils. It's got the small um, white flowers that are very fragrant, and they also provide berries for wildlife later in the year. Carolina cherry laurel grows from 15 to 30 feet high. This is another evergreen with shiny, um, shiny waxy leaves and these showy clusters of white flowers. So it's going to, the whole bush or tree will look nearly white when it's blooming. It prefers moist, well drained, loose soils and is attractive to both birds and bees. Staghorn sumac is a really nice one. It's one of my favorites, but it's one that a lot of people see as more of a weedy species. But the sumac has lots of to offer numerous times during the year. Not only does it have this attractive white flower, but then that white flower is going to go then transition into these red spikes of berries that are attractive to wildlife. Um, and then in the fall, bright red foliage. So sumac has visual interest numerous times during the year. Carolina Silverbell is one of my favorites, and if I had room anywhere else in my yard to put something, this would be it. The flowers start to come out right before the foliage does, and so you see that picture of the blooms on the left, and the foliage has just come out, and it looks like these flowers, these white flowers are just floating in the shaded habitat. It also has stripy looking bark, which we see in the middle, so some very pretty cool visual interest with that. They tolerate and will bloom in sun or part shade and are attractive to butterflies, honeybees, bumblebees. Um, this is a really nice one that we don't see as often, but they're, they're nice additions to the yard. Dogwood is a southern gardening staple. It can grow from 20 to 40 feet high and has showy white or pink flowers. And I have flowers in quotation marks because if you look at the picture in the middle, and the area in yellow, that's the actual flower. And then the white part on the outside are actually like leaf racks, so modified leaves. And then the part that's of interest is going to be that yellow part right in the middle, the true flowers. It is going to be covered in white in the early spring, right before the leaves come out. And then in the fall, has a very pretty scarlet foliage, so visual interest twice during the year. In addition, berries are produced that are attractive to wildlife. Bees, birds, butterflies will all take advantage of this tree. Um, they like well-drained acidic soil. It's important to note that in some areas, the dogwoods will be susceptible to dogwood anthracnose and downy mildew. Dogwood anthracnose, um, there are resistant varieties. So that would be good to communicate with reputable nursery um, businesses and be sure that if that's an issue in your area that you're getting the varieties that are going to be resistant to that. Redbud is another favorite of mine. It does not get very large, it grows 15 to 30 feet high, has pretty heart-shaped leaves and these showy pink flowers, again, early spring. And so the entire canopy of the tree is gonna turn purple, pinkish purple, and will be jam up, especially with honeybees, um, not honeybees, uh, bumblebees all over them. Leaf cutter bees will also use the leaves, so you look for the leaves and see the cutouts where they've taken sections of the leaves. Um, very, very attractive to bees. They like uh, moist, well-drained soil. And this makes a mature red, but makes a nice little climbing tree for kids as well. Witch hazel is a tree that most people don't even know exists. Um, it grows 10 to 15 feet high. It's a small tree. Its range covers all of eastern North America. And so there's many places that this can grow. They've got fragrant flowers in the mid to late fall. 
So most things have been, we've talked about bloom, bloom in the spring, but this one actually blooms in the fall when most other trees have lost their leaves. So that's very distinctive. Often the only color that you're going to see after leaves have fallen will be the witch hazel blooms. They are attractive to birds and at interest, they are pollinated by a winter fly noctuid moth, which is pretty cool. And you may not recognize witch hazel as a tree name, but most people remember it as a medicinal um, name. And if you go to the pharmacy and look around the peroxide and alcohol, there'll be a little plastic container called witch hazel. And it's an anti-inflammatory astringent that can be used for minor skin, skin irritation from the same plant. And so sometimes it's more known in the public for that than actually being a tree that's good for pollinators. So those have been smaller trees. And then a couple of larger trees, if you have the space for it, are, are these are pretty common natives. They may already be growing in your neighborhoods. Red maple grows 50 to 100 feet tall. It has visual interest twice during the year with red flowers in the early spring that covers the canopy and then bright foliage in the fall, as well as during the growing season, just having a nice general green canopy. Red maple can grow in a variety of conditions. Not only is it attractive to bees and other pollinators, but it's also a larval food for, co uh, for caterpillars. And then tulip poplar. This one can get 50 to over 100 feet tall. It's got a long straight trunk and large showy yellow flowers. When we think about trees blooming, you know, other than things like Southern Magnolia, a lot of times with big trees, we're thinking of inconspicuous flowers, but that's not the case with tulip poplar. Their blooms are about two, two and a half inches or more across. Big yellow flowers um, that we typically don't see on these big trees. So very nice visual interest in the spring. In addition, it's got bright yellow foliage in the fall. So very pretty addition and it grows pretty fast. Um, so nice addition to a yard. It's a resource for, for birds, bees, and butterflies, and is a larval host for the eastern swallowtail butterfly. Um, most of us are on our lunch breaks, and I could go on and on about all of the different trees that provide wonderful pollinator resources. Things like southern sugar maple, red buckeye, fringe tree, southern crab apple, black cherry, and sourwood. And I'm really excited about the research that's being conducted currently on our native trees and pollinators so that we can have much more in-depth information on this in the future. We know that canopy trees are attractive to pollinators, and I think it'll be so interesting to find out more information on that in the future. But to cover a couple more things, because we, if we're dealing with trees and we're in the urban forest, then we're in shady habitats, so we need more than just trees. We also want to have different layers for pollinators, so a couple of easy to access plants for the general public that can add pollinator resources in other layers. Begonias. Begonias are wonderful pollinators. I get bumblebees on mine. Six o'clock in the morning, they're out there on the begonias. Um, and if you go into any box store like Lowe's or Home Depot or Walmart, these are widely available. Um, you know, when we started this Trees for Bees project, we did wonder, should we only focus on natives? And that would be great, but the problem is that for many people, native plant nurseries are not very accessible. And so we wanted to give information and give resources to people that would give them achievable goals. So begonias, you know, widely available, a good pollinator resource. Impatiens are another one that um, are very available. The picture on the upper right hand, left hand corner is from my yard, and I typically see butterflies on these numerous times during the day. So another very accessible resource. And then hydrangeas, and I mentioned that they're, they're widely available, but it's easy to get the wrong kind. And what I mean by that is that um, we usually see mop head hydrangeas. Those are very commonly sold, where the whole flower head just looks like a big mop. And if the picture in the upper part of the, of the slide is a lace cap hydrangea. So you'll notice that there is a ring of flowers around the edge and then little spiky things in the middle. The part in the middle are the actual flowers. The pink on the edge that looks like flowers are modified leaves. So lace cap hydrangeas have the actual flowers 
that pollinators use, while mop head hydrangeas have been bred to not have that. Oak leaf hydrangeas are a native that do have floor resources for pollinators. They get very big, they do well in the shade, so that's a nice addition. And then smooth hydrangeas in the bottom right hand corner looks like a mop head, but the actual real flower parts do stick out between the modified flower leaves. So those can be used as pollinator resources as well. So to cover the materials that we have made, the Trees for Bees team at University of Georgia, which again was made up of entomologists, uh, horticulturalists, a plant pathologist, uh, garden, school garden specialists, as well as extension agents. Um, those materials are available at the extension protecting pollinators page that's pictured here. And if you Google UGA extension and protecting pollinators, um, that will give you to all those resources. Products from this team effort included extension papers, newsletter articles, video, shade garden tutorial, an annotated PowerPoint presentation that is not up yet, but should be up on the site in the next couple of days, color sheets for kids, and a pollinator nesting box project. So we've got an extension paper on managing turf grass insect pot pest while being protective of pollinators. Again, the creating pollinator nesting boxes document, which gives um, its numerous pages, gives lots of information and examples, as well as step-by-step -step guidance on how to integrate this into your um, extension and education activities. And then selecting trees and shrubs as resources for pollinators. Most of the information on the trees from this presentation came from this document. These are all peer-reviewed. And the selecting trees and shrubs is a really great one to give people options. Sometimes I know shade gardeners feel like their hands are tied and they don't have a lot of resources, but it includes lots of different woody shrubs and small trees um, with lots of information to help people make choices for their, for their yards. And then on the left-hand side, picture two different newsletter articles with pictures that can be incorporated into your blogs or your newsletters or your websites um, that are there for your use, as well as about a one and a half minute um, video. And then posters to use that can also be printed out as color sheet for kids to just add another layer to your outreach activities. And then uh, building a bee hotel that in the pollinator nesting box document. You can, it's a one pager that can be printed out that again shows everything that you need. Um, this was not a one person project. This effort was made by numerous people. It was a team of us and I would like to thank the other team members for their contribution to this project. And with that um, I would be open for questions and again Google the UGA Extension Protecting Pollinators page for these materials. If you need help or guidance, if should you choose to do trees for bees activity and want to use these resources, I'm available. My contact information is on the bottom right. Um, and in addition, if you do these activities, we would love to hear about it. Please shoot us an email and tell us all about your event so we can see, you know, how widely these materials are being used. And if you will look at the chat function, the very top entry is the website that you can click on. And so again, thank you so much for your time today. I, I genuinely appreciate it and I'm so excited to be able to share these materials with you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ben. That was excellent. Um, so Everyone, this is Holly Campbell again. I'm your host, and um, I understand if some folks have to leave, but we're going to do make some time for answering questions. Um, so again, if you have questions, please please type them in the Q and A box, um, not the chat box, because um, I have trouble <laughs> keeping up with both of them at the same time. So again, all questions for the speaker go in the Q and A box. Um, and I'm going to go over some of the contents of the slide that you're viewing right now while you're typing your, um, your questions in for Dr. Benton. 
So um, again, for those who join later, our speaker was Elizabeth Benton. Uh, she's with the University of Georgia and her email address is repeated here again if you would like to reach out to her about any, any aspects of um, the presentation today. Again, today's webinar will be archived or listed as quote unquote on demand on forestrywebinars.net. I will have it uploaded in the next couple of days. So you can refer that on to other people or you can watch it again. So um, again, as mentioned, this, this webinar today is part of a series of 12 webinars that we have offered this year, starting in March this year. And the, um, today's webinar is number eight of 12. And our ninth webinar will be on July 24th. It's called Transitioning from Gray to Green Infrastructure. And it's about water quality in the urban forest. And so that'll be presented by Robert Northrup of University of Florida. I, IFAS extension again on July 24th and so you can find out more information about that webinar on forestrewwebinars.net as well and if you have any information or have any questions about the webinar series um, you can contact me Holly Campbell at my email address here um, and you can also find a full listing of all the webinars in the series uh, several of which are already archived at sref.info so um, if some of you need to take off, we do have a short satisfaction survey that we would love some feedback on improving these webinars. Um, so please take that. Um, or if you have elected to receive International Society of Aboriculture, which is ISA, or Society of American Foresters, which is SAF, so either ISA or SAF, continuing education credits, um, you'll want to return to your open browser window to continue that process that's offered in step two at forestrywebinars.net. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start with some questions here. And we have quite a few. I just FYI, we won't be able to answer all of them um, because we will, we will end the webinar at two so I'm going to sort of field some of these for Dr. Benton. Um, so we had one um, attendee ask are there any thoughts on the impacts of climate change on pollinators? Dr. Benton you may be muted. <laughs> Okay, Hi, I, I think that that is probably an area of active research right now. It's not my research area, um, but I imagine when I go to our national entomology meeting that we'll be seeing talks on that. Okay. I've, I'm imagining that people can probably find um, some information online about that. Okay, so... Um, I, let's see, I'm going to read this one out. I am an urban forester, a consulting arborist, and a trained beekeeper. Um, I can tell you from my own professional experience that um, even when you follow the label for pesticides, um, uh, neo, neonics pesticides, the re residual effects are such that they, Im they impact pollinators long after the time frame that the label's usage encourages. Um, I have not permitted their usage on any project I've worked on because of their toxicity. Um, for months and months after usage, and I, you may want to speak to that. I, I certainly can, and it is an area of my active research. I have worked with um, longevity of hemlock and forest, uh, a longevity of neonics in forest settings, specifically with hemlock. And so, um, number one, this is a, a controversial issue, and I will say that there has been some very bad research in this area and there has been some very excellent research in this area so you really have to be careful with what information you're getting and where you're getting it there is an ongoing study at um, that Clemson University is part of right now where they've looked at um, treating and nursery settings and then how long it's effective um, in plants after the nursery setting and I think that we're going to have new management recommendations for nursery coming out of this research I am currently researching this in forest areas to see, you know, how far are we spreading from the place that we're applying around a tree laterally. And so I think it really depends on what you're treating, how you're treating it, and what's growing around it. Okay. Um... So, Dr. Benton, I'm not... I'm just 
going to ask you, do you, do you know much about cultivars of flowering trees and their effects on pollinators? No, I don't. Okay, I may, I may skip over that question. Uh, okay. Um, I can answer the one below that. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm scrolling okay, through. There's quite a few. <laughs> right, the biggest threat to pollinators in my area is overuse of pesticides sprayed for invasive plants and widespread use of insecticides for mosquito control. Parks and rec spray widely on school grounds and parks. What do you see as responsible use of these chemicals? All right, that's a, that's a big question with a big answer. Um, number one, insecticides. Um, when we talk about pesticides, there are things, there are insecticides and then there are herbicides. Herbicides are sprayed on plants. And so those are things that, um, let's just take that out of the picture because those are active on plants and not insects. And then using insecticides for mosquito control, it depends on what kind of insecticide they're using. Quite often they're using an insecticide called BT, or um, Bacillus thuringiensis, and that kills mosquito larvae, but it's not active on um, things that are not dipterin larvae. It's the same kind of BT that is used in BT corn, but that strain is only effective on Lepidopteran larvae. So it depends. If it is a broad spectrum insecticide, then that can be problematic. It also depends on when we're treating. Um, we're treating generally from mosquitoes and things like that in the evenings, whereas most of our pollinators, say most of them, are more active during the middle of the day. I don't think that we have a perfect answer for everything, um, but it's important to remember that everything is a trade-off. And if we talk about the effects of one thing in isolation of the situation in which that problem is residing, um, then we're not taking a fair view on it. And so sometimes we do need to back off of pesticide use or change how we use it. Um, and that really depends on the, on the situation and the trade-offs. So I would encourage everybody to be well-read, read information from good sources, and then consider all sides of the equation to have a well-balanced view of what the situation is and the most responsible way to proceed. Okay, so uh, regarding bee hotels, do they need yearly cleaning or do the bees clean out previous home building by other bees in the past year? That is a great question. Bee hotels are not without maintenance and some, you don't want to sit a bee hotel out and leave it forever. And so think about a bee hotel as like a, a, about a two-year product and then replacing it. Some bee hotel vendors will recommend getting paper tubes to line them and then replace it where other bee specialists really want to see that um, whole piece of wood removed and another one put out um, and keeping the wood fresh so pathogens aren't in there as well. So my best advice is to think of it as a product or resource that you will maintain. And so it may be that you change out the paper tubes or that you let the bees emerge from one year and then put out a fresh one for the next year. You don't want to take it out and then if the brood's still developing or if the young are still developing and haven't emerged yet, but you do want to have a fresh source. So I'm planning on replacing mine every two years. Great, we have, um, we have another insecticide question here um, that I'm probably going to mispronounce. Are there are there research-based research guidelines for using systemic insecticides on urban trees? For example, how long does, uh, in, <laughs> it's I-M-I-D-A-C-L-O-P-R-I-D. Imidacloprid? Yes. How long um, does it stay in trees? Is it toxic in flowers when applied as a soil drench? I'm not right. sure if, you, if you're familiar with that. Uh, yeah, that's ex exactly what I do research on. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I asked so, the right question. Then. For instance, in hemlock, a systemic insecticide can be effective for seven or more years. Hemlock is a non-flowering tree. It has minimal effect to community arth uh, canopy arthropods. So we're not seeing in canopy problems with hemlocks. It's it's effective for seven years because it is an evergreen tree. And deciduous trees, these are the ones that are going to be flowering. The neonicotinoids are not that long lasting. So it'll last, you know, a year or so. 
there is new research that has just come out that is not published yet um, on some flowering plants, some blooming trees. And so when we consider neonicotinoids, we also need to consider the alternatives that we would use, um, things like avermectins that are, would, would be like a mimectin benzoate. And that's what we would use if we're not using the neonicotinoid. And so I think there's some research that's going to be coming out on that pretty soon that compares the two different products. Um, so that's one that a year from now I would have more information on when that research comes out. Um, are they toxic when applied to the soil flowers as a soil drench? They, they can be. Um, the label for those have just changed so that things that are um, like linden trees, we can't treat anymore. So check the label on that. Um, a lot of times we don't have to apply the full labeled rate. We can apply less. And then be careful of when you're applying. Um, if it were my tree in my yard, the first thing I would ask is, do I need to treat this tree? What am I treating it for? Is it actually causing a problem? And is, is it something that I actually need to be applying a pesticide for? And secondly, I would probably, if possible, wait until after it's bloomed. We can't spray a tree while it's in bloom for one thing. And systemically, we need to consider our, our best way to reduce impacts is, I think, to wait after bloom time. Great. Um, just before we do another question, we have a few more minutes left, but I wanted to, um, for those who are still on, to make a note, just to, there are a couple of entries that people have put in the chat box that may be of interest. One of them is from Tamberly Conway with US Forest Service, and I'm, I'm actually going to put it in the chat box again, but she lists a number of resources um, with the US Forest Service that may be of interest to to folks on uh, participating on this webinar today. So I just sent, I just put that in the chat box again. Um, and it looks, it looks like uh, Tamberly added something else as well. So everyone check those out. And let's see what else we have here. And feel free, um, Dr. Benton, if you see a question you would like to answer as well. Okay, which species of chili basswood are bee friendly? Which ones are considered bad for bees? Um, yeah, I have seen some recent stuff about that they're possibly having some effect. Um, I would say if you're if you're treating anything in the Tilia genus, don't use any insecticide, any um, systemics on it, and, and according to neonic labels, you're not supposed to treat those anymore. So if you have a product with an old label and it doesn't have that warning, get an updated product label. Okay. Um, so there's a, a question uh, that someone had put in the chat box and then they moved it to the Q&A box. I appreciate that. Uh, it says, with a pollinator garden or in, in a highly urbanized neighborhood, what is the likelihood of attracting insect species potentially far afield? So getting some of these pollinators into these highly urbanized areas. That's a really good question. And um, I know some pollinators do go very far and if we provide habitat islands along the way, then they're not going to have to expend as many resources and from going from place to place. Um, so anyhow, um, I think the best that we can do is provide that habitat and see what comes. I know that I live in a neighborhood and most of the yards are pretty manicured and I'd say per 100 houses in the neighborhood, I'm probably the only gardener and um, I have seen the difference that it's made in my yard in the last year and a half that I've been gardening it. And it's, it's really encouraging to see all of the different pollinators that I'm providing a resource for. So there was another question that um, said, are there any suggestions for Acer or maple alternatives in areas where the urban forest composition is between 40 to 60% Acer, Acer species that would provide the same sort of hosting benefits that Acer species do? I would say look on the Trees for Bees publication about um, the one that I listed that was on the far right on the UGA extension page. And there is a whole list of trees and the benefits that they provide. And so then it would be that that's your list of options. Great. And lastly, just because we're right here at the end, um, 
are invasive plants taken into consideration before planting for urban areas? And I, I know through your webinar, you really didn't talk about a lot of things that could become, or anything that could become potentially invasive, but I that wondered if correct. you wanted to respond to that. I don't think you should plant invasive plants. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, I take it into consideration and I think everybody else should and that comes back to us, the ones of us that are educators and have the ability to educate. And you know, some invasive plants are great pollinator resources, but for the ecosystem as a whole, it's not a good trade-off and I try to take a holistic view when I look at things. Great, okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Benton, for this incredible webinar that you've provided today. And I wanted to um, give you an opportunity to say anything else if you wanted to share any last words before we close out. Sure, um, please feel free to use any of the pollinator materials on the extension, UGA extension page. Um, I would love, we, the team would love for them to be a resource to people. And if you are able to use them, please shoot me an email and tell me all about your, your educational activity. We'd love to see what people are doing with it. Great, thank you so much. Okay, well, thanks everyone for joining the webinar and thanks again to you, Dr. Benton. And so everyone have a great day.